Lecture 12, um, this is of module 8. We'll be discussing DNA transcription and translation. The objective. Transcription and translation is often called the central dogma of molecular biology. Dogma uh, is the set of principles of truth. Uh, and so tonight when we discuss transcription and translation, these processes will show us how DNA, the blueprints of the cell and the organism, uh, will be used to create RNA and then later the protein. Um, and so this is how these blueprints are used to make building blocks um, that make the cell. Uh, and transcription, uh, this is uh, the coding in the DNA uh, will be copied to RNA molecule, uh, and this will be taking place in the nucleus. Uh, and then translation is where the RNA molecule uh, is then converted to a protein, and this will be taking place in the cytoplasm on the ribosome. And we'll be getting in much more detail to both of these processes. Transcription is also considered RNA synthesis, uh, the creation of RNA. Transcription, transcription uses DNA as a template to produce the RNA molecule. The nucleotide sequence, the adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine um, nucleotides in the DNA uh, will determine the nucleotide sequence of the RNA um, as it is transcribed. Much like when a DNA molecule is replicated, um, it's very similar in how an RNA molecule is created from um, one of the templates of the DNA. And we'll show more descriptive pictures. Um, the RNA sequence is a complementary uh, to the DNA, just like the new strand of DNA that's created uh, is a complementary, a set of complementary pairs, base pairs uh, of nucleotides. Um, translation is protein synthesis, the creation of proteins. Translation takes place on a ribosome. Ribosomes are found outside of the nucleus. Yes, ribosomes are created in the nucleolus, but this is not where this is going to take place. Uh, the, nucleo the nucleolus are where ribosomes are created. Once they have been created, they go to the outside of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And this is where translation will take place. Um, they could be free-floating ribosomes in the cytoplasm. They could be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, both of these uh, sets of ribosomes will be able to make proteins from translation. There are three types of RNA, and they all interact, they all interact with each other to carry out translation. Messenger RNA, also known as mRNA. This is bringing the information from the DNA out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. So this is the actual molecule that is being created, being copied from the DNA. Ribosomal DNA, RNA, ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is the actual molecule that makes up the ribosome. The ribosome is made up of mostly RNA, and it is this rRNA molecule that creates the ribosome. Then you have transfer RNA, or tRNA. And this is a molecule that will be bringing the amino acids to the ribosome when the messenger RNA is present. Uh, and it will be bringing these amino acids to build the actual protein uh, based on the code of the messenger RNA. Making brownies is a lot like making proteins. And we're going to use making brownies as a metaphor here for transcription and translation. Um, so let's say you have a valuable cookbook. It's a family heirloom, um, and that's where the recipe for your family brownies are. Uh, and so 
this cookbook is very valuable you don't want to take it out to the kitchen where you can spill food on it so instead you store it somewhere safe when you need to get a recipe from the book uh, you open it up and you copy the recipe onto a piece of paper from the book uh, this is uh, just like transcription uh, you are transcribing the recipe from the book onto a piece of paper uh, the cookbook is the DNA, the new piece of paper is this messenger RNA molecule. Um, then, translation, you take that piece of paper with the recipe into the kitchen, and you start getting all the ingredients that you're going to need, and then you read this uh, recipe on your piece of paper, taking the ingredients uh, in certain orders, uh, putting them together to make brownies. Just like uh, the, in translation, you've got the messenger RNA leaving the nucleus going into the cytoplasm uh, where all of these T RNA molecules are coming with amino acids to create the protein. Uh, another metaphor that I like to use and you've heard before is building a house. Uh, if you have the blueprints for a house, it's kind of a, it's a very expensive piece of paper, uh, papers. Uh, and you don't want to take them to the job site where they could get torn up and dirty, so you leave them in the office. When you need to take these blueprints out to the field, you make a photocopy of them. And so this is this transcription. Once those photocopies are made, you take them out to the field uh, and you read those to create the house that you are building uh, with all the parts, all the, you know, the bricks, the wood, the nails, concrete, everything coming together to create your house or to create this protein. So let's take a little closer look at this RNA molecule. Uh, as you'll see, there are a lot of similarities that RNA has to DNA, uh, but there are a lot of differences as well, and you'll be accounted, accountable for knowing these similarities and differences. RNA, just like DNA, is a nucleic acid. <coughs> it is one of the, nucleic acids are one of the four uh, macromolecules we learned about earlier in the season, in the semester. They are single-stranded. DNA was this double-stranded helix molecule. RNA is just one side of that. Uh, it is single-stranded. RNA uh, is made of nucleotides, just like DNA. Uh, nucleotides are the monomers that will make this RNA molecule. The RNA nucleotide is made of the phosphate group, um, very similar, the same uh, phosphate group on the DNA and, and in the RNA. Uh, the ribose sugar so a five carbon sugar just like dna but instead of deoxyribose which is found in dna this is ribose and so it has this extra oxygen so deoxyribonucleic acid dna is missing this oxygen but ribonucleic acid has this oxygen then you've got the nitrogenous bases in the same location as your uh, DNA nucleotides. And there are four types of uh, nitrogenous bases. Adenine, which is also found in DNA. Guanine and cytosine, also found in DNA. But uracil is found in RNA and not, there is no thymine in RNA. Thiamine is found only in DNA. So uracil takes the place of thiamine when you are talking about RNA. So now we'll take a closer look at some of these similarities and differences. As you can see on the left-hand side is the examples of DNA. On the right-hand side are examples of RNA. And so they're side by side so we can actually compare and contrast. The first thing that we're going to look at is the lack of oxygen on the deoxyribose found in DNA, whereas that oxygen is present on the ribose um, sugar in RNA molecules. 
the nucleotides, uh, the bases. So in both lists, we have adenine, cytosine, guanine. But in DNA, we have the presence of thymine. And in RNA, we have the presence of uracil. For DNA, we see the double-stranded molecule, this double-stranded double helix. Uh, with RNA, it is single-stranded. Now it says, generally, uh, there are some examples out there of double-stranded RNA. Uh, most of those that I know of are found in different uh, types of viruses. But most of RNA examples are single-stranded. Looking a little closer at the nucleotides um, found on the right and the left, and looking at the, in the center, uh, the DNA double helix molecule and the single-stranded RNA molecule. So now we're going to look at the three classes of RNA, the, the, the three different types of RNA. We kind of already talked about them a little bit, but now we've got some pictures to go with them. So up at the top, we've got messenger RNA, um, and this molecule is going to be carrying the instructions from the DNA out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm to the ribosome to create the protein. So it is this messenger molecule taking the message of DNA out into the cytoplasm. So it is messenger RNA or mRNA. Looking at these introns and exons, I won't describe this now. Uh, we'll talk about this later, uh, but the, the way that the way that this mRNA is constructed has a little bit more complexity to it. Um, the next that we'll talk about is the tRNA, uh, transfer RNA, and <clears throat> it has kind of this T shape to it. Um, and it has two different ends. On one end, the amino acid will be attached. On the other end will be an attachment to the actual messenger RNA itself. And we'll look at that a little bit closer when we're talking about translation. The rRNA, the ribosomal RNA, this is a zoomed in picture of a ribosome. The ribosome is kind of like, a, uh, it has like the hamburger bun, uh, the top hamburger bun, bottom hamburger bun. The messenger RNA slides into the middle through uh, these two different molecules. And so the ribosome itself is made of RNA, um, the rRNA molecules, and we'll look at that at closer uh, view as well. So now we will look at the nitty gritty uh, bits of transcription and translation. We'll start with transcription, uh, and so this is um, using the DNA to create the RNA. So transcription comes from the word transcribe. Uh, to transcribe is to copy. Um, and so we're copying the code of DNA onto the molecule RNA. Um, transcription occurs in the nucleus, and this is where the DNA is. Uh, so the RNA molecule will be created in the nucleus right next to the DNA. Let's first look at how a cell produces an RNA copy of a gene. Uh, and so a gene is a portion of DNA that will be transcribed to make a particular protein. So the bit of DNA that is being transcribed is called a gene. And that bit of DNA that's being transcribed will eventually create a protein. Uh, and so a gene is a portion of the DNA molecule that codes for a particular protein. So RNA nucleotides are going to pair with the DNA nucleotides. Just as we saw DNA being copied um, to create a new strand of DNA and we saw the nucleotides, uh, the complementary pairs coming up and, and extending, elongating the, um, the new strand of DNA, this RNA will be created in a similar way. 
Um, so to make this messenger RNA molecule, complementary pairs, complementary base pairing will take place between the RNA and DNA. Now, <clears throat> just like an RNA, we've got um, down at the bottom, thymine, the complementary pair of thymine is adenine. The complementary pair to guanine is cytosine. Cytosine is guanine. So these are the same. Um, down these, these three down at the bottom are the same as DNA. Uh, but the, very one at the, the one at the very top is different. Um, since there is no thymine in RNA molecules, uh, the thymine cannot pair to the adenine. So that means when an adenine nucleotide is found on the DNA molecule, the uracil will pair to that. Um, and so you might be looking, well, you know, there's a thymine down here and adenine pairs to that. Well, this thymine is when, is, is talking about when the thymines are found on the DNA molecule. Um, then the adenine will pair to it. So that's, that makes sense, hopefully, uh, because thymines are in the DNA molecule. They're just not in the RNA molecule. Instead, we have uracil that will pair to the adenine when it is found. Uh, transcription. So when we are talking about transcription, <coughs> we will be talking about an enzyme RNA polymerase. This enzyme will basically be doing all of the work uh, to, to transcribe a RNA molecule from a DNA strand. Uh, so when we were talking about DNA replication, there were lots of different enzymes that were involved. The list of, um, you know, uh, hexase, uh, ligase, uh, DNA polymerase, all those things were needed. Here, we are just talking about RNA polymerase. Uh, and so this is a big one because that list of enzymes for DNA replication can get confusing when you're talking about transcription. Try to remember all of those different enzymes that we talked about before was DNA uh, replication and RNA polymerase is for the creation of RNA in transcription. The RNA polymerase um, will be used to uh, open up the DNA molecule and expose uh, the strand, the template strand, um, to be copied. One strand of the DNA will be the template for the messenger RNA transcription. So on the bottom, you can see how the DNA has been opened up, and you've got this RNA being created from the top strand. The RNA is only being created from the top strand. The bottom strand is not being copied, just this top strand is, and that is considered the template. The DNA at the top is considered the template, and it is a template for this RNA molecule that is being transcribed. Um, it will begin at a area called the promoter. The promoter is found on the DNA molecule. It is a certain code, a certain uh, sequence of nucleotides that is promoting uh, the RNA polymerase to attach to it and open up the DNA at that spot. And that is where the transcribing of the RNA molecule will start. So the promoter is where transcription starts. Uh, Complementary base pairing will take place. Um, on the bottom, we see uh, you know, you've got your ATGA. Well, it starts adding uh, complementary bases. We've got UACU and so on. Uh, the RNA is created from a 5 to 3 prime, just like DNA. The nucleotides have to be attached to the 3 prime end. So that means that they are created the same way as that leading strand of DNA uh, that is 
being created during um, your DNA replication. So that leading strand is a continuous strand being built. And this RNA is being built in that fashion, uh, in a five to three prime, which means that this three prime that's at the end is where the next nucleotide will be attached, uh, attached to the three prime, attached to the three prime, attached to the three prime. And it will end, the transcription will end at the terminator. And so this is another sequence of DNA um, on the template strand that signifies the ending of transcription. So transcription will start at the promoter and it will end at the terminator. So now I'll talk about the same steps that I did in that last slide, but just this one showing a little closer detail of what is happening. Um, <clears throat> and so just like DNA replication, we're talking about the three steps, um, initiation, elongation, and termination. And so these three steps are also how transcription is described. Uh, and so it's going, transcription will be taking place uh, occurring in three steps. Uh, the first, initiation. In initiation, the, uh, the RNA polymerase will attach to the DNA molecule and it will attach at the promoter. The promoter is that sequence found on the DNA molecule. So this RNA polymerase will attach to that and then it will start unzipping the DNA and going, working its way down. Um, and so in this picture at the top, we're not 100% which one is the DNA template strand, um, but the, the way that this RNA polymerase enzyme is, is oriented will determine which of these two it will be creating the new uh, RNA molecule. And as we can see at the bottom, this template strand is found at the bottom. And so the template at the bottom is where the sequence, the, DN, the nucleotide sequencing will be used to create the RNA nucleotide sequencing. And then we can also see that the promoter is found and it's showing you that found on the bottom strand. So that is initiation, the connection of the RNA polymerase enzyme onto the promoter of the DNA and unzipping. Uh, elongation. So this is where the RNA molecule will be elongated, created uh, at length. And so, as you can see, the, the RNA polymerase is chugging away down the R DNA molecule, unzipping uh, and creating the RNA, uh, and then it zips back up behind it. And so we get a closer view here. Um, and so this is where the beginning of this RNA is being created. Uh, and so it's adding these nucleotides to match up with the DNA nucleotides. Um, and at the end, the very end, where it's going to add the next nucleotide is the three prime end of the RNA because it is built from the, from the five prime end over here to the three prime end just like DNA is created. Um, then the termination uh, step, the RNA molecule, sorry, the RNA polymerase molecule will reach the terminator sequence that is found on the DNA template. Once it reaches that, then the RNA polymerase is released and leaves this molecule, leaves the DNA molecule. The RNA molecule that's being created will then break off and float away. And so then it will be separate from the DNA and the DNA will close back up. So now the messenger RNA molecule has been created. It has been transcribed from the DNA. Uh, it is floating around in the nucleus still, um, but it is not ready to leave the nucleus to make a protein yet. It needs to be processed. Um, and processing, there are a couple steps that take place on this molecule before it is ready. Um, when the 
RNA has been transcribed from DNA, there are portions of the DNA. Uh, so the, the portions of the DNA that got transcribed is a gene. So this whole molecule here um, would be a gene uh, that has been transcribed. And on this DNA, there are portions called exons and introns. Exons and introns. Um, and when the RNA molecule is transcribed, it too has the exons and the introns. Now, the introns are portions of the DNA that are not useful uh, for this gene, for the creation of this protein. The exons are the coding that, are, that is actually useful and needed. Um, and so the introns need to be cut out so that the introns are put together uh, and they will be the true coding that is used for the protein to be created. Uh, and so if you think about it, the exons are going to be put together to exit the nucleus. The introns are going to be cut away and they're going to stay in the nucleus. They will not be leaving. So exons are exiting, introns are staying in. So these exons will be put together uh, and create this new code, this new uh, sequence here. Uh, and then a cap needs to be put on the five prime end. Uh, so this is the five prime cap. And a poly A tail is put on the three prime end. So this is a sequence of a bunch of adenines. And so this kind of allows the, uh, the molecule to have a certain end uh, so that it can move in a certain direction out of the nucleus. So once the exons have been put together and a five prime cap and a poly A tail are put on, this messenger RNA molecule is now ready to leave the nucleus. So now that this messenger RNA molecule is leaving the nucleus, we are finished with transcription. And now moving on to the next step, translation. And translation is creating a protein from the messenger RNA molecule. Translation will occur in the cytoplasm on the ribosomes. Uh, the ribosomes could be free-floating in the cytoplasm or they could be attached to a rough endoplasmic reticulum. The ribosomes are able to read the messenger RNA to create the proteins. And the way they do that, they read the nucleotides in triplets. Those triplets are called codons. Uh, you can see at the bottom, uh, so when we look at this RNA molecule here, uh, their three letters, the three nucleotides, are one color, and that is indicating that they are a codon. The next three are another color, and that represents another codon, and so on and so on. Each of these codons will be read as one, and it will translate to an amino acid that will be creating the protein. Remember that a protein is a string of amino acids. And so these codons, the triple triplet uh, nucleotide, um, <coughs> will convert or translate uh, to the amino acid, a particular amino acid. There are 64 different codons that can exist. Uh, the reason that is, there are four bases. So we've got the adenine, cytosine, guanine, uh, uracil. Uh, so those four bases, and when they're put in groups of three, when you do that math, you have 64 possibilities um, that those 64 possible codons that can exist. Um, there are 20 different amino acids. Uh, and so um, with that, you can kind of determine that some of these codons, uh, there will be more than one codon for some of these amino acids. Most, uh, most of the amino acids correspond to more than one codon. Uh, example, of, um, example of this, um, glutamate is an amino acid and uh, it 
corresponds to GA, uh, the codon GAA, and the codon GAG. This is a chart that we will use to figure out which amino acids are going to line up uh, to build this protein um, when you've got certain codons. Now, I'm not going to make you do this, you know, an entire, uh, an entire protein, um, but you should know how to do this. Um, and there's a homework that we will go over um, that will talk about how to use this, and, and we'll do this with the homework to make sure that you guys know what you're doing. Uh, but this chart here is red in a way uh, on on the left hand side this is where the first base of the triplet uh, will be read um, uh, on the top is where the second base will be read and on the right hand side is where the third base will be read uh, so let's uh, let's let's do an example here. Um, so AUG is a special codon, uh, and it's considered the start codon, um, and it is the only start codon that we have. Now AUG. So let's see how this works. You start with the first base over here, which is A. So you look at these four letters, and A is where we're starting. So A will be the row that we're going to be dealing with. So everything will be found here. Um, and then the next base is a U. The next base up here is a U. So you go to that second base up at the top. And so these are what we're working with. Uh, G over here, A, C, and U. Since the second one is U, that is the column that we're working with. So where A correlates with U, is in this cell right here. The third uh, nucleotide in the triplet is a G, um, G here. And so, um, so you'll read the third base over here. So since we know that this is the cell we're working in, you'll look at the four letters here on this row, U, C, A, G. And since G is what we're looking for, it will be on the bottom of this cell. And boom, methylene, um, methamine uh, will be our start codon. Um, this will be the, uh, the, an amino acid that will correspond with um, AUG. And that's how you read this chart. There are a couple other codons that uh, are considered stop codons, uh, and we'll look at how those work. Um, but basically, when you see one of these three codons, um, it signifies to stop the creating of the protein, and that is where the protein will stop. Um, it will prevent further amino acids to be added, um, whereas the start codon um, that is the first amino acid that is placed. So that methanine is always the first acid that is put onto uh, these proteins. So this kind of gives a rundown of what we're, what we're looking at so far. So transition to transcription, um, the transition from transcription to translation. Um, so up at the top, we're seeing uh, transcription taking place. Uh, we've got the DNA template um, and then the RNA that is being created from that DNA template. When looking at the triplet nucleotides here, the codons, um, and when you read them off the chart, uh, they will correspond to a particular amino acid. And these are three amino acids uh, that correspond to these codons up here, and that is translation. Um, and then this, uh, these amino acid sequences, this polypeptide, this is your protein. You know, this one is a three amino acid protein. Uh, they are all much larger than that. And again, the codon is a three nucleotide sequence that encodes for one amino acid. Um, 
the three classes of RNA again. Uh, we've already talked about this. Um, this translation is where all three of these will now be coming together to create the protein through translation. Uh, we've already seen how the messenger RNA was created. Now we'll watch how the messenger RNA will slide through the ribosome uh, and the tRNA will bring the amino acids to this ribosome uh, to create the protein. So the tRNA molecule that is coming to the ribosome will be translating the genetic code of that messenger RNA into the amino acids. Uh, so it'll be translating the codon on the messenger RNA into a particular amino acid. This tRNA molecule is basically doing what we did on that chart. Um, but instead of reading the chart, there are 64 different tRNA molecules out there with a anticodon, which is basically the complementary pair of the codon, um, so that it can attach to that and bring the amino acid to it. Uh, the transfer RNA, uh, the tRNA molecule, brings the amino acids to the ribosome. The tRNA uh, molecules um, are adapters that recognize the genetic code. They recognize the codons. And how do they do that? They have this anticodon on them. This anticodon is the opposite, the complementary pair of the codon. So remember that the codon is found on the messenger RNA the anticodon is found on this tRNA because this tRNA will be attaching uh, to the messenger RNA. And then at the other end of this tRNA, you've got the amino acid um, that is going to correspond, correlate to the codon. Um, that chart works off of the codon, not the code of the anticodon. Um, and so, the tRNAs uh, match up to the RNA. The tRNA binds to the messenger RNA codon through the anticodon uh, and uh, binds to the corresponding amino acid. So on another location, the amino acid is going to be attaching to the other amino acid, the binding site of the other, other amino acid that are building the protein. Um, and so, you know, this anticodon, so UAC, what codon would correlate with that? Uh, that would be AUG. And so this is the anticodon of the start codon. The start codon, remember when we saw that back on the chart, it was AUG. Uh, well, this is the complementary pair this right here is the complementary pair of AUG. Uh, and so this is uh, going to be the methamine uh, because that is going to correlate with that AUG uh, codon. Uh, and there are 64 different codons, which means 64 different anticodons. Um, well, I have 62 here. Um, because there are um, stop codons, but really there are three stop codons, so really that's uh, 61. But that's, you, you won't need to know that. Each step in translation happens on the ribosomes. So transla translation is happening on the ribosomes themselves. The ribosomes help all of these DNA, uh, all of these RNA pieces uh, interact with each other to create the protein. There are, <coughs> there are two pieces of the RNA. There is the small subunit and the large subunit. And if you think of them kind of like uh, hamburger buns um, that come together and then the, uh, the inside uh, meat 
uh, area is where the, the action will be taking place. Um, and so this large subunit uh, is where the tRNA molecules will be coming in and binding. The small subunit is where the RNA will be coming in and binding. And so when you put these together, then you'll have this area of interaction. Uh, and these molecules are huge. Um, you know, this is a, a 1900 uh, base pair here, uh, just the small one. So an overview uh, of what is taking place um, during translation. Again, we've got initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, in the initiation, the messenger RNA, the template, uh, is binding to the small ribosomal unit. Um, as you can he see here, the small uh, ribosomal, the small RNA unit is attaching to the R to the messenger RNA, and uh, then the large ribosomal unit will come into play, um, and it will come in and it will attach uh, with the tRNA attaching as well. So the initiator tRNA molecule um, binds. So this uh, start, start codon, uh, this methamine will come in and attach to the AUG. Uh, the AUG is the start codon, and so the UAC is the anticodon that is attaching uh, to, to this start codon. And on the other end is this methamine, uh, the amino acid. So the initiator uh, tRNA molecule binds. Uh, its anticodon matches with the start codon, uh, and so that's what we're seeing here. Um, the, the anticodon, again, is this complementary base of the start codon. The start codon is what we used on that chart to figure out what amino acid course correlates with it. The anticodon is this complementary base uh, that matches that codon. Um, and in this case, the AUG is matching up with this methamine. Next is the elongation step. And so this is an elongation of the amino acids, um, the creation of the protein itself the elongation of the protein. Uh, and we're going to see how the amino acids are joining together. So once the large subunit of the ribosome has attached into the um, messenger RNA, and now everything has kind of come together as a whole, um, the second tRNA will enter the ribosome. And so, um, so this one was the first one, this methanine attached to the first codon. Uh, and now we have the second one coming in, attaching to the next codon. Uh, the next codon is this GGA, uh, and if you look on that chart, it will correspond with this glycosine. Uh, I believe that's um, the GLY uh, is. Uh, and so, um, so the second tRNA is coming in to the ribosome and attaching. As these two are attached, you then get this bond taking place uh, between the two amino acids, this peptide bond um, holding these two together. Um, the elongation of this protein uh, is continuing, uh, and how it's doing that, this ribosome here is sliding down the messenger RNA following this arrow. It's slowly going down the messenger RNA. As it does so, um, this tRNA that was attached to this first codon is now outside of the ribosome. Once it's outside the ribosome, it breaks free and floats away. Well, the methamine that was attached to it, that it brought in, does not leave with it because it is connected by the peptide bond to the other amino acid 
which is being held by the ribosome. So as the ribosome slides down, the next tRNA molecule comes in that matches up with this next codon, bringing in the next amino acid, and a peptide bond is formed. It slides down, the next, um, the next TNR, tRNA will be released, but the amino acid will remain, and as this ribosome goes down the messenger RNA, you can see how the amino acids are being elongated. This protein is being elongated and being created by these codons and the tRNA molecules. Um, I believe I got all of these. So then we get to the, the end, uh, the termination uh, part of the protein. Um, now, this protein is only five uh, amino acids long, which is unrealistic, but you know, it, it gives us an idea of how this was created. And um, so as it slides down and then gets to this, uh, this stop codon, UAA is a stop codon, once it reaches there, a release factor protein attaches. Instead of a tRNA molecule coming in, a release factor protein comes in. And so basically when this comes in, it kind of puts a halt to the creation of this amino acid. And the protein, the uh, RNA keeps going, and then the protein will be released um, Um, at this point, the protein is complete. Uh, the polypeptide detaches from the messenger RNA, RNA complex uh, and folds into um, a functioning, um, functional, this, this word should say functional, protein. Now, you know, if this were free-floating ribosome, then yes, uh, this amino acid, uh, this polypeptide, this protein uh, could be finished. Uh, or this uh, amino acid chain could be inserted into the rough ER. And inside the rough ER, uh, things are changing the shape of, these, of this protein and creating it in certain ways, maybe adding certain other molecules to it. Um, so in all, you know, aspects here, the protein is complete, uh, as in it has been, uh, the coding of the amino acids has been added to it, and that is complete. Um, a polysome is when multiple RNA molecules, I'm uh, sorry, multiple ribosomes are attaching to this one piece of messenger RNA. RNA. So, and this is the beginning of the RNA, the ribosome attaches, and it starts making. Uh, so you could have multiple of these RNAs making multiple proteins from a single messenger RNA. Uh, and this cluster of many ribosomes translating one messenger RNA transcript is called a polysome. Uh, and it allows for rapid synthesis of proteins. This is a... Um, electron uh, microscope picture of that taking place. Uh, what happens after translation? Uh, so this is what I, I alluded to before. The polypeptide chain, the protein um, shape can be modified or other molecules can be added. Um, this changing of shape uh, can take place in the rough ER or the Golgi body. Protein synthesis uh, is highly regulated. So we just saw protein synthesis, which is the creation of proteins. Uh, there's a lot of factors that are going in, a lot of things that are regulating um, which of these messenger RNAs are being created from DNA, which genes are going to create uh, these, pro these messenger RNAs, uh, which are going to create these proteins. Um, this doesn't just happen by chance. Uh, there is a lot of certain order to this, and it's highly regulated. 
the reason protein synthesis requires a lot of energy a lot of ATP is needed to create all of these proteins to create all of these different molecules uh, that are taking part here cells can save energy by only producing the needed proteins um, at, at one time. Both prokaryotes are bacteria and eukaryotes, uh, the large um, organelle having cells, um, can regulate protein synthesis in different ways. Uh, cells can regulate proteins made by regulating which genes are transcribed or expressed. So it starts with what part of the DNA is going to be transcribed. Um, if messenger RNA is not created, well then you don't go through all the time and effort and energy to create all of these other steps. So if you can regulate transcription uh, of certain genes, uh, then you are starting from that beginning there. Uh, some proteins um, have to be made all the time. So certain cells are pumping out certain proteins all the time. Uh, transcription and translation of those genes uh, are happening all the time. Other proteins are only needed during certain conditions. Enzymes are only needed when those certain reactions are going to be taking place. If the substrates of a certain reaction are not needed, uh, or if sub the substrates of a reaction are not present, then that enzyme is not needed, and so the synthesizing of that enzyme is a waste of time. Um, and so when proteins are needed under certain conditions, um, this can allow flexibility uh, in some specialized cells. Uh, so there could be certain cells that are going to make those particular proteins instead of having all cells make. Uh, a certain cell can make them and then move them around the uh, multi-organism, uh, the multicellular organism. So when learning about gene regulation, uh, we're going to start off with how bacteria does this. Uh, and so we'll learn a little bit about how um, bacteria has their genes set up. Bacteria um, have what is called operons. Operons are a group of genes next to one another on their DNA. Instead of um, just one gene being transcribed, multiple of these genes can be transcribed at once. Um, they also have this promoter uh, in the beginning, which is what we learned before and something called an operator that can control the transcription or regulate when it is transcribed. The promoter uh, is a site uh, in, on the DNA uh, that will allow the RNA polymerase to attach and begin transcription. The operator is a sequence of DNA located between the promoter and the genes themselves. Uh, and so an example of an operon is a lac operon, uh, which controls the production of the enzyme that breaks down lactose uh, in E. coli. And so we'll look at some pictures to see exactly how this does this. Um, what uh, would this enzyme be needed if lactose isn't present? So lactose is the sugar found in milk. Uh, e. coli is eating this lactose. But if no lactose were present in the environment around this E. coli, the E. coli would be wasting its time creating this enzyme if the food's not there for that enzyme to break down. Uh, and so this is why uh, this operon needs to be regulated. So at the top, we see the lac operon. This lac A, lac Y, and lac Z. These are all genes found on the DNA, grouped together. Uh, then you've got this promoter region in the beginning. Uh, this is where the uh, RNA polymerase will attach to start transcription. But a portion of this promoter is called the operator. Uh, now, the operator, um, when the environment lacks lactose, 
uh, a repressor molecule will bind to the operator. So the operator is this little bump and the lactose, um, sorry, the repressor is binding to that operator. And that is stopping RNA polymerase from being able to attach and transcribe. If lactose is present, the lactose will bind to this repressor and the repressor will fall off the operator. When there is no repressor, the RNA, the RNA polymerase can then attach to the promoter area and then it's going to chug along and transcribe all of these genes. So if you look at what is the molecule that is actually stopping um, or which is binding to this repressor and pulling it off, it's lactose. That makes sense because if the presence of lactose is there, then that means this bacteria, this E. coli, needs to create the enzymes to break that lactose down. So if the lactose is present, uh, it will pull off the repressor and then these genes can be transcribed uh, to create the enzyme that is going to break down this lactose. Once the lactose is gone, it will not be attached to this repressor anymore and the repressor will go back to attaching to this operator and that will stop the transcribing of these particular genes. And that is a LAC operon. Eukaryotic organisms um, have something called transcription factors. Uh, transcription factors will bind to DNA at specific sequences that regulate transcription. Uh, they may bind to a gene's promoter, and so again, the promoter is the area right before the gene that is going to be uh, transcribed. It is the, the promoter is the area where the RNA polymerase will be attaching and starting to uh, transcribe. Um, and then the um, binding turns on the protein synthesis. So uh, I will, this is an example here, um, but I think on the next page there is a better, a better picture with a lot less uh, activity going on. <laughs> so transcription factors. Um, we've got this piece of DNA um, and down at this right end, so at the top here, over at the right, this will be the gene that is in question that needs to be transcribed. In front of this gene, you've got the promoter. Um, and um, further down the, uh, from the promoter, you've got these areas called enhancers. Um, and so uh, these could be way far away. They, in this picture, they show really, you know, close to one another, but they could be way far away uh, distance-wise from the actual promoter and the gene. And then you've got this portion of the promoter called the Tata box, um, which is a, a, an actual portion of the promoter um, that will kind of allow for things to, to bind to it. Um, and so transcription factors uh, are molecules that will bind to the enhancers. So these enhancer, uh, these enhancer regions of the DNA, um, when these transcription factors are present, they will attach to these regions. Um, the Tata binding protein um, will also come in and attach uh, to the Tata box. So one take home message here is there is a lot more factors involved uh, when it comes to uh, eukaryotes. Uh, I'm not saying that prokaryotes are very simplistic in how they regulate and how they um, transcribe and translate, uh, but there are a lot more factors involved here on um, the eukaryotic side. A lot of players that are involved here. Uh, these transcription factors have to attach uh, to these 
uh, enhancer areas. Another molecule is attaching to this promoter, um, and um, all of this is needed before the next step, uh, where the transcription factors are then binding to the Tata uh, protein. So this DNA then wraps onto itself. It bends over on itself, uh, where all of these molecules then come into contact with one another. They're attracted to one another. They come into contact to build this complex. Once this complex, once this complex is built, then the RNA polymerase can attach and start transcribing. So all of these steps need to take place before the RNA polymerase can then start to transcribe that particular gene. Uh, and it's just kind of showing the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes and the extra factors here that are needed.